So I want to talk about um, that knowledge, full discernment, like Paul was talking to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy 3, 7, some are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge or full discernment of the truth. And the writer of Hebrews, in uh, Hebrews 10, 26, he says, for there remains no more sacrifice for sin once we have come to the knowledge of the truth, the full discernment of the truth. Same thing Paul was writing to Timothy about. And the same thing Paul was referring to in 2 Corinthians 10, 6, when he said, having a readiness to punish every disobedience once your obedience is complete, fulfilled. And that word that he uses for that Greek word that he uses there is the same one that he uses in Romans 8, 4, when he says that the righteous requirements of the law may be fulfilled or carried out by those who uh, walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And that, the same Greek word he uses in Galatians five sixteen when he says, I say then walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill or carry out the evil desires of the flesh. The same Greek word used in reference to Jesus, I think it's in Matthew 5, 17, when he says, uh, for I came not to destroy the law nor the prophets, but to fulfill, to complete. And so we need to, underst we need to understand that. And, and Peter writes concerning that knowledge in Second Peter chapter 1. He says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. And that is the same knowledge, full discernment, that he uses, that is used in other places concerning those who have come to the knowledge of the truth, the full discernment of the truth. And Peter is saying, grace and peace be multiplied to you through this full discernment through him. And he says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge, full through that full discernment of him that called us to glory and virtue. And uh, I think some might render that glory and praise, but it... it the virtue has to do with um, moral, moral goodness. And he says, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And he says, through these glory and virtue and you know I think some people pervert the glory thing is in you know this they get all puffed up and and exalted and it's just talking about because Paul wrote when he was writing uh, in the third chapter of Philippians when he says you know those who glory in their shame and whose God is their belly, who mind or set their affections on, of their mind on earthly things. And same, same context of what Peter is talking about. And he says, whereby the glory and the virtue through the through the knowledge, full the, through the full discernment of him that called us to glory and virtue. 
He says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may, might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And it says, Paul said in Galatians 5, uh, 16, 17, and 18, he says, I say then walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill or carry out the evil desires of the flesh. And he says, the, in verse 17, he says, for the, for the Spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh against the Spirit, and the two are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you will. Uh, it's translated as would, but it just has to do with the will so that you cannot do the things that you will. That's why when he says, you know, if you will believe with your whole heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess him, Lord, you shall be saved. You know, and this goes back to what Jesus said in Luke six forty six. He said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? You know, when we confess him, Lord, I mean, I mean, you got to... You got to see, especially in in his day, to call someone Lord mean, meant to surrender to their rule. And this is what Paul is talking about: to confess him Lord, to con, to surrender our will to his. And that is the same idea that he is showing in Galatians two twenty when he says, "I am crucified with Christ." Nevertheless, I live, but yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because as he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to, to be at home in the body is to be absent from the Lord. But as he said in verse 7, he says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, it's the Holy Spirit of promise that seals us. As he as he describes it in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 says if you therefore be seated with Christ at the right hand of God he says seek those things which are above not the things which are below set your affections in that same Greek word to set the affections of your mind on those things which are above and not the things which are below and as he says in verse 3 of Colossians 3 3 right after that he says for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Meaning your life is hid with Christ in the Holy Spirit. So here he says, besides this, you know, talking about having escaped the, the corruption that is in the world by the promises that we have in Christ and by the deliverance that we have in him, through the knowledge, through the full discernment of God and of Jesus Christ, same same thing as saying, you know, the the knowledge of the truth, the full discernment of the truth, as Jesus said in in uh, John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And you got people baptizing in a Trinity, and God's not a Trinity. First off. And there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And Jesus is the door. There's no other door. There is no other door. And we need to get a hold of that. And, you know, it matters how we are baptized because we are being baptized into Jesus Christ and into his death, as he describes in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And as he also uh describes in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, when he says, else what are they to do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not? You know, so, and in Colossians 2, 12, you know, talking about, you know, being baptized into the death of Christ, into, you know, into the body of Christ through the death, the into his death through baptism. And, uh, I mean, we got to understand that it is that God, as Colossians uh, 1, 21 through 23 says, that we were once alienated 
by you know uh, from God by wicked works in our mind he says yet now has he reconciled us through the body of his flesh through death you know so we need to see that this is the message of the gospel this is the hope of glory Christ in us you know that is this is the faith that overcomes the world you know And Peter's describing how that we can, he says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, by these great and precious promises might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge and and the word he uses knowledge there is is the same one he uses in uh, uh, second Corinthians 10 5 when he says casting down imaginations and every lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God but he also uses that Greek word knowledge in First Corinthians chapter eight, where he says, "For we know." Let me go there. He says, "Now as touching things offered to idols, we know that all that we all have knowledge." And that's that same same word, Greek reference eleven oh eight. The other one for full discernment is nineteen twenty two, for your uh, Strong's and for your Vines. Uh, ex, uh, expository dictionary of Greek words and uh, he says and if any man think that he knows anything he knows nothing yet as he ought to know he says but if any man love God the same is known of him he says as things touch as touching Things offered to idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. See, this knowledge puffs up. And he's not referring to the knowledge of the truth, which is the full discernment of the truth that is in Christ, that Jesus himself said in John eight thirty one through 36, that if you are truly my disciples, you will remain in my word, his teaching, his doctrines. He said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And he says, whoever, you know, a servant doesn't remain in the house forever. He said, but a son does. And the King James has rendered that uh, the son, but Jesus is making a contrast between a, a child and a servant, you know, and I mean, we got to understand that because then right after that, he says, and whoever the son will make free is free indeed. You know, and, and that's what Paul is teaching. That is what Peter is teaching. And he says, uh, going back, going back to second Peter chapter one, uh, uh, Chapter, uh, verse 5, he says, And besides this, giving all diligence to your faith, add virtue into virtue, knowledge. I mean, because we need knowledge to grow in faith and to uh, let that full discernment come of the truth. As he says, if you, if you go back and you'll look at Second Corinthians chapter 10 when he said, right after it, uh, casting down thoughts and imaginations and everything lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of god you know that science fragmentary knowledge this is he says uh in verse six having a readiness to 
avenge, punish every disobedience once your obedience is complete, fulfilled, meaning talking about coming into full age. Because it's the same thing the writer of Hebrews is talking about in chapter 10, 26. There remains no more sacrifice for sin once you've come to the knowledge of the truth. And so we need to understand that. And he says, add to, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and knowledge temperance um, meaning self-control and to temperance patience meaning long-suffering and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity For if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge. There we go, that full discernment of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, but he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And that's the same thing the writer of Hebrews is talking about in, in chapter 9 and 10. You know, the Old Testament sacrifices were never able to take away sin. For There is a remembrance of sin every year. He says, but Jesus, he says, this man offered himself for sin one time and sat down at the right hand of God, henceforth anticipating, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. So we need to understand that. He says, you can't see afar off and has forgotten he was purged from his old sins. He says, wherefore the rather, brethren, Give diligence diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. That means stumble. And he says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, after my departure, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Um, Or the prophetic word made more sure. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit 
in chapter 2, verse 1, right following, he says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and, br and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. You know, and I'm going to stop there because when he says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who probably shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon them swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, blasphemy spoken of. And, and this is where that, you know, no one's perfect doctrine that's out there now. And, I mean, I cannot stress that enough. I, you know, that's why I wanted to read these verses from the Apostle Peter to stir up those that will hear I mean because as soon as you start as soon as you start preaching you can live a holy and godly life you can you can live free from sin even as Paul says he who's dead is freed from sin Romans 6 7 and in verse 14, he says, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. You know, and, and people speak evil of that. People speak blasphemy about that, you know. I mean, it's, it's like the greatest majority of people that, that, say they believe on Jesus Christ, view themselves as sinners. And and I'll, upon that, I'm going to, I want to read what the writer of Hebrews wrote concerning that view, concerning the blood of the covenant whereby we are sanctified, by which we are washed. You know, that Peter just spoke of. He says, he says, in chapter 10, he says, uh, right after he says, in verse 12, he says, but this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And we got to know that he's talking about the conscience because that's what he just got through talking about in chapter 9 where the Old Testament sacrifices were never able to make the comers there unto perfect as regard to the conscience in chapter 9. And then in, in uh, chapter 10, verse 1, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifice which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. And, he, and in chapter 9, he says, uh, he says, which was a figure that for the time then to come in chapter 9, 9, 
and then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Okay, so here he says, um, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Where of the Holy Ghost, and that's what he's talking about in chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, or the the ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. He says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, talking about of the flesh, purge your minds from evil works to serving the living God. But people still want to get off on this John 1, 8 thing. You know, well, if anyone says they have no sin, you know, and I got to know that John's talking about the law of sin that was sowed into the flesh. And and Paul speaks of that in Romans seven twenty three. I see another law in my flesh and my members waging war against the law of my mind and bringing it into captivity to the law of sin that is in my flesh. You know, that's why he said in Romans 8, 2, the law of this life that is in the spirit of Christ has made me free from that law of sin and death. You know, so, I mean, we need to understand that. That's why the law is sin strength, 15, uh, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty six. That's why it says in uh, Romans 7, 4, you know, consider yourselves dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him that is risen from the dead. And in verse 6, he says, having died to the law that held us prisoners to sin, that we should serve God in newness of spirit, not the oldness of the letter. As he said in, in uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16, 17, and 18, he says, you know, so then, you know, we don't know anyone from after the flesh anymore. You know, even though we've, we may have known Christ after the flesh, you know, we don't know him that way anymore. He says, therefore, for this reason, so then, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things are become new. And he says in verse 18, right after that, he says, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us back to himself in Jesus Christ. You know, so, I mean, so we need to, I mean, we need to get a hold of all this. this he says, he says, uh, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he hath said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these are, there is no more offering for sin. And having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of the holiest, the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He's talking about baptism, water baptism, being baptized into Jesus Christ. You know, ha putting off this old man, the body of sin, you know, by the faith of Christ in baptism. I believe God raised him from the dead. I've made him Lord. I've confessed him Lord. 
You know, it's more than lip service. It's actually surrendering our will. We're dying. We're being planted in death. That means we're surrendering ourselves. You know, it's not that, well, now I've been baptized and born again of the Spirit, and now I can get all the things that I want. And this is not the message. It's like Jude said, they turned the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness. You know, who, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, glory in their shame, whose God is their belly, and who set their affections on earthly things, set the affections of their mind on earthly things. You know, and he says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose you? Shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God? Of how, Let me repeat that. Of how... He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy or common thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. You know, and we need to understand what he's talking about. You know, he was talking about all these people running around calling themselves sinners and no one's perfect. And, and you know, quite honestly, they're not trying to live any better. They're not trying to live any better. They're not trying to set their affections on the things above. I mean, they're, they're just, they look just like the world. They sound just like the world. And there, there is, there's nothing that can convict them of being a, a Christian. You know, there is nothing that can convict them of being godly or holy in Christ or a child of God. You know, and you know, really need to think about that because, you know, I mean, when we stand before God as as Paul even wrote, he says, we shall give account for everything that we do in this body. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 that by our words we shall be justified and by our words we shall be condemned for man shall give account for every idle word that he speaks, you know. Life and death is in the power of the tongue how you think of yourself in Christ. I mean, even if, if you've even been born again of water and the Spirit, baptized into Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean, you, <laughs> I mean, the scripture is so plain that you got millions of people that have probably been baptized in the, in, into a trinity. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not even names. <laughs> Oh my, you know, it's foolishness. I laugh at foolishness. <laughs> you know, it's like people hear these things and they just, they, they walk away and they're like, oh, oh well, man.
As Peter said, we've been born again, not of a corruptible seed, but the incorruptible word of God. You know, John says, now are we the sons of God, not children of God. It says sons it is a male child. But as Romans 8, 14 says, you know, it's been rendered children, but it actually says that whoever is led by the Spirit of God are the ones born of God. And because it just means the offspring. And it's very significant because Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. You know, if we have, and, and I remember, I remember when I was converted. The freedom and the peace of the Holy Spirit. There, there is no, all these people that say I didn't feel anything is because they never were born again. You got all these people deceiving other people that, you know, they can they can make a confession and be saved. You know, and this really goes back to my last video that I just made, you know, concerning you must first bind the strong man. You know, because there are a lot of people that, that, you know, if they're not possessed by the devil, they're oppressed by the devil. You know, and you do not enter a strong man's house and spoil his goods, meaning strip him of his armor in which he trusted. And, you know, unless you first bind him. I mean, and we need to understand that. I mean, you know, the deliverance The deliverance that we get from God man, is indescribable. And if you're claiming to have been born again and regenerated by water and the Spirit, and, and you're saying that I, I didn't have no experience. I didn't feel anything. That's because you weren't born again. I mean, that's that's just the truth and that's a fact because you are not born again. You are not regenerated and given a new nature by God in Christ by planting this body of sin and death and clothing yourself with Christ as Paul describes it in Galatians uh, 3.27 as many were baptized into Jesus Christ have put on Christ have been clothed with Christ that is the circumcision you know And just because you've been born again does not mean that you've come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, don't put yourself out there like that. That is just a snare. You know, we have got to walk humbly. If we want to, re if we want God's favor, to his grace to remain in our life for obedience, we got to watch what comes out of this mouth. Don't let other people provoke you into boasting about anything about yourself. You know, because that is exactly what Satan gets people to do. I mean, he's been doing it for, for hundreds of years now since, since Christ. You know, do not, do not be ignorant 
of Satan's devices. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it on that. And I'm gonna repeat something that Paul said. Without holiness, no one is gonna see the Lord. And those that will live godly in this life will suffer persecution. And that is just, he didn't say maybe or if, you know. You know, it doesn't mean to go around provoking it, but when you're, when you're promoting the truth of the gospel, you're going to be persecuted for, for it. And it's like, it's like Peter said, you know, they just, uh, damnable heresies, you know, uh, speaking blasphemies against the way of the truth, you know. And we need to we need to get a hold of the truth of the gospel. And and like Peter said, and even even then there was false prophets. Even as today there are false teachers, you know, saying, Oh, you know, all is all is well and all of this and people just do whatever they want. Observe Halloween, you know, which is which is high day and I mean, all this foolishness. I mean, and even, you know, even Christmas and the Christmas tree and the bulbs hanging on it. I mean, that that's the Christmas day is is the the day of bow worship. <laughs> that was that was who Jezebel corrupted Balak. Bal you know, to corrupted the children of Israel with. So, I mean, we gotta, you know, we gotta wake up, stop thinking that we can just do, you know, just because First Corinthians six twelve and ten twenty three says all things are lawful for me, Paul is trying to convey a state of mind, not not to tell you that you can do whatever you want, because in Romans three thirty one he says, do we void the law through faith? God forbid, certainly not. We establish it. But the thing is, is we don't establish it by putting ourselves back underneath the yoke of the law because that is sin strength. You know, we, you read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12, Paul describes that he's, he's talking about Jews that are coming and they're trying to bring them back underneath the bondage of the law. And he calls them super apostles, you know, transforming themselves, you know, messengers of Satan transforming themselves into messengers of light and he says be not deceived for Satan himself can be transformed into an angel of light which I believe there's a lot of people that cl that are claiming to have seen Jesus today uh, have seen Satan and not Jesus so you know we kind of we got to think soberly We gotta think soberly.